The Mayflower Compact was the first governing doctrine document of the Plymouth Colony. It was written by the colonists, later together known to the history as the Pilgrims, those who crossed the Atlantic aboard the Mayflower. It was signed by 41 of the male passengers on November 11, 1620, as dated on the old Julian calendar. On the Gregorian calendar, it occurred on November 21st. That calendar was adopted by England in 1752. As you know, it was signed aboard the ship in what is now Provincetown Harbor near Cape Cod. The Mayflower Compact, November 11th, 1620. Governor William Bradford, one of the 41 signers. And it listened to all of the glory that is given to God. Thanksgiving focuses on God. In the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign, Lord King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith, etc., having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith and honor of our King and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another covenant and combine ourselves into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid. And by virtue hereof to enact, constitute and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, under which we promise all due submission and obedience, in witness whereof we have here under signed our names at Cape Cod the 11th of November in the year of the reign of our sovereign Lord King James of England, France, and Ireland the 18th, and of Scotland, the 54th, Anno Domini, which means Year of Our Lord, 1620. John Carver, William Bradford, Edward Winslow, William Brewster, Isaac Allerton, Miles Standish, John Alden, Samuel Fuller, Christopher Martin, William Mullins, William White, Richard Warren, John Howland, Stephen Hopkins, Edward Tilly, John Tilly, Francis Cook, Thomas Rogers, Thomas Tinker, John Rigdale, Edward Fuller, John Turner, Francis Eaton, James Chilton, John Craxton, John Billington, Moses Fletcher, John Goodman, Degory Priest, Thomas Williams, Gilbert Winslow, Edmund Margeson, Peter Brown, Richard Bitteridge, George Soule, Richard Clark, Richard Gardiner, John Allerton, Thomas English, Edward Dotty, Edward Leister. 41 men determined to establish a land for the glory of God. One year later, 1621, the first Thanksgiving Day was officially held by the pilgrims. This was followed by many times of thanksgiving, but the first known and recorded official public thanksgiving proclamation was announced 50 years later in 1671. June 29, 1671, Charlestown, Massachusetts City Colony Council. Quote, 
Again, notice, the focus is on God. That's what thanksgiving is about. The holy God, having by the long and continuous series of his afflictive dispensations in and by the present war with the heathen natives of this land, written and brought to pass bitter things against his own covenant people in this wilderness, yet so that we evidently discern that in the midst of his judgments, he, that is God, hath remembered mercy, hath remembered his footstool in the day of his sore displeasure against us for our sins. Can you imagine a town council passing this today? For our sins. And with many singular intimations of his fatherly compassion and regard, reserving many of our towns from desolation threatened and attempted by the enemy, and giving us, especially of late, with many of our confederates, many signal advantages against them, without such disadvantages to ourselves as formerly we have been sensible of, if it be of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed, it certainly bespeaks our positive thankfulness when our enemies are in any measure disappointed or destroyed, and fearing the Lord should take notice under so many intimations of his returning mercy, we should be found an insensible people as not standing before him with thanksgiving, as well as lading him with our complaints in the time of pressing afflictions. The council has sought me to appoint and to set apart the 29th day of this instant June as a day of solemn thanksgiving and praise to God for such his goodness and favor, many particulars of which mercy might be instanced, but we doubt not those who are sensible of God's afflictions have been diligent to espy him returning to us, and that the Lord may behold us as a people offering praise and thereby glorifying him the council doth commend it to the respective ministers, elders, and people of this jurisdiction solemnly and seriously to keep the same beseeching that being persuaded by the mercies of God, we may all, even this whole people, offer up our bodies and souls as a living and acceptable service unto God by Jesus Christ, dear people, this nation was founded as a Christian nation based on thanksgiving and praise to Almighty God. That brings us a little farther to the 1771 Congressional Thanksgiving Proclamation. Henry Lorenz, President of the Continental Congress, November 1st, 1777. For as much as it is the indispensable duty of all men to adore the superintending providence of Almighty God, to acknowledge with gratitude their obligation to Him for benefits received, and to implore such further blessings as they stand in need of, and it having pleased him in his abundant mercy, not only to continue to us the innumerable bounties of his common providence, it is therefore recommended to the legislature or executive powers of these United States to set apart Thursday, the 18th of December next, for solemn thanksgiving and praise that with one heart and one voice the good people may express the grateful feelings of their hearts and consecrate themselves to the service of their divine benefactor that together with their sincere acknowledgments and offerings they may join the penitent confessions of their manifold sins whereby they have forfeited every favor and their humble and earnest supplication that it may please God through 
the merits of Jesus Christ mercifully to forgive and blot them out of remembrance, that it may please him graciously to afford his blessings on the government of these states respectively and prosper the public council of the whole, to inspire our commanders both by land and sea and all under them with that wisdom and fortitude which may render them fit instruments under the providence of Almighty God to secure these United States, the greatest of all human blessings, independence and peace, that it may please him to prosper the trade and manufactures of this people and the labor of the husbandmen, that our land may yield its increase to take our schools and seminaries of education so necessary for cultivating the principles of true liberty, virtue, and piety under his nurturing hand, and to prosper the means of religion for the promotion of an enlargement of that kingdom which consisteth in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And it is further recommended that servile labor and such recreation as, though at other times innocent, may be unbecoming the purpose of this appointment, be omitted on so solemn an occasion. By order of Congress, Henry Lawrence, President, Continental Congress, November 1st, 1777. Look at our Congress today. Would they pass a resolution based on the merits of our Lord Jesus Christ and pass a resolution for the enlargement of that kingdom which consisteth, and quoting from Scripture, in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. How far we have fallen. That brings us to 1789, the Presidential Thanksgiving Proclamation of President George Washington. Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, and humbly to implore his protection and favor. And whereas both houses of Congress have, by their joint committee, requested me, quote, to recommend to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts the many and signal favors of Almighty God, especially by affording them an opportunity peaceably to establish a form of government for their safety and happiness." Unquote. Now therefore, I do recommend and assign Thursday, the 26th day of November next, to be devoted by the people of these states to the service of that great and glorious being who is the beneficent author of all the good that was that is or that will be, that we may then all unite in rendering unto him our sincere and humble thanks for his kind care and protection of the people of this country previous to their becoming a nation, for the signal and manifold mercies and the favorable interpositions of his providence in the course and conclusion of the late war, for the great degree of tranquility, union, and plenty which we have since enjoyed, for the peaceable and rational manner in which we have been enabled to establish constitutions of government for our safety and happiness, and particularly na the national one now lately instituted, for the civil and religious liberty with which we are blessed, and the means we have of acquiring and diffusing useful knowledge, and in general, for all the great and various favors which he has been pleased to confer upon us. And also, 
that we may then unite in most humble offering of our prayers and supplications to the great Lord and ruler of nations and beseech him to pardon our national and other transgressions to enable us all, whether in public or private stations, to perform our several and relative duties properly and punctually to render our national government a blessing to all the people by constantly being a government of wise, just, and constitutional laws discreetly and faithfully executed and obeyed to protect and guide all sovereigns and nations, especially such as have shown kindness to us, and to bless them with good governments, peace, and concord, to promote the knowledge and practice of true religion and virtue, and the increase of science among them and us, and generally to grant unto all mankind such a degree of temporal prosperity as he knows alone to be best given under my hand at the city of New York, the third day of October, in the year of our Lord, 1,789, signed George Washington. That brings us to New Jersey, where we are. The 1791 New Jersey Governor's Thanksgiving Proclamation Governor William Patterson, by His Excellency William Patterson Esquire. Governor, Captain General, and Commander-in-Chief in and over the state of New Jersey and territories thereunto belonging, Chancellor and Ordinary in the same. Proclamation. Whereas it is at all times our duty to approach the throne of Almighty God with gratitude and praise. The governor of New Jersey. But more especially in seasons of national peace, plenty and prosperity, I have therefore thought it fit, by and with advice and consent of the Honorable the Privy Council, to assign Thursday the 8th of December next to be set apart and observed as a day of public thanksgiving and prayer, for the great and manifold mercies conferred upon this land and people, and particularly for the abundant produce of the earth during the present year, for the spirit of industry, sobriety, and economy which prevails, for the stability and extension of our national credit and commerce, for the progress of literature, arts, and sciences, for the good order, peace, and plenty, and the civil and religious liberty with which we are blessed and also that we may unite in our supplications and humbly implore the almighty ruler of the universe that he would be pleased to continue his protection and goodness to this land and people, to smile upon all schools and seminaries of learning, to promote agriculture, manufactures, and commerce, to illuminate and guide our public councils, to bless our national and state governments, and today they don't even want to let someone pray before they meet to enable us all to discharge our official, social, and relative duties with diligence and fidelity, to eradicate prejudice, big bigotry, and superstition, to advance the interest of religion and the knowledge and practice of virtue. And for this purpose, listen carefully, this was a governor of New Jersey, and for this purpose, to pour out his Holy Spirit on all ministers of the gospel and to spread the saving light thereof to the most distant parts of the earth. Can you imagine a governor saying that today? Oh, we are told to pray for those in authority over us. And dear people, we've just gotten a new governor. Given under my hand and sealed at arms at Trenton, the 21st day of November, 
in the year of our Lord 1791, William Patterson, by His Excellency's command, bows Reed, Secretary. That brings us to one of the most sobering of all the presidential proclamations. The 1863 Presidential Thanksgiving Proclamation by President Abraham Lincoln on October 3rd, 1863. The year that is drawing towards its close has been filled with the blessings of bountiful fields and healthful skies. To these bounties, which are so constantly enjoyed that we are prone to forget the source from which they come. Others have been added, which are of so extraordinary a nature that they cannot fail to penetrate and soften even the heart which is habitually insensible to the ever watchful providence of Almighty God. In the midst of a civil war of unequaled magnitude and severity, which has sometimes seemed to foreign states to invite and to provoke their aggression, peace has been preserved with all nations. Order has been maintained. The laws have been respected and obeyed. And harmony has prevailed everywhere except in the theater of military conflict. While that theater has been greatly contracted by the advancing armies and navies of the Union, needful diversions of wealth and strength from the fields of peaceful industry to the national defense have not arrested the plow, the shuttle, or the ship. The ax has enlarged the borders of our settlements, and the mines, as well as iron and coal as of precious metals, have yielded even more abundantly than heretofore. Population has increased steadily, notwithstanding the waste that has been made in the camp, the siege, and the battlefield. And the country, rejoicing in the consciousness of augmented strength and vigor, is permitted to expect continuance of years with large increase of freedom. No human counsel hath devised, nor hath any mortal hand worked out these great things. They are the gracious gifts of the Most High God, who, while dealing with us in anger for our sins, hath nevertheless remembered his mercy. It has seemed to me fit and proper that they should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and voice by the whole American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States and also of those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. And I recommend to them that while offering up the ascriptions justly due to him for such singular deliverances and blessings, they do also with humble penitence for our national perverseness and disobedience. Commend to his tender care all those who have become widows, orphans, mourners, or sufferers in the lamentable civil strife in which we are unavoidably engaged and fervently implore the interposition of the almighty hand to heal the wounds of the nation and to restore it as soon as may be consistent with the divine purposes 
to the full enjoyment of peace, harmony, tranquility, and union. In testimony whereof I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of these United States to be affixed. Done at the city of Washington this third day in October in the year of our Lord, 1,863, and of the independence of the United States, the 88th. Signed, A. Lincoln. That was the proclamation that established Thanksgiving Day as a national annual holiday at the height of the war between the states. That brings us to 2017, the presidential Thanksgiving proclamation of President Donald Trump. President Donald J. Trump proclaims Thursday, November 23rd, 2017, as a national day of thanksgiving. By the President of the United States of America, a proclamation. On Thanksgiving Day, as we have for nearly four centuries, Americans give thanks to Almighty God for our abundant blessings. We gather with the people we love to show gratitude for our freedom, for our friends and families, and for the prosperous nation that we call home. In July 1620, more than 100 pilgrims boarded the Mayflower, fleeing the religious persecution and seeking freedom and opportunity in a new and unfamiliar place. These dauntless souls arrived in Plymouth, Massachusetts in the freezing cold of December 1620. They were greeted by sickness and severe weather and quickly lost 46 of their fellow travelers those who endured the incredible hardship of their first year in America, however, had many reasons for gratitude. They had survived. They were free. And with the help of the Wapanaug tribe and bountiful harvest, they were regaining their health and strength. In thanks to God for these blessings, the new governor of Plymouth Colony, William Bradford, proclaimed a day of thanksgiving and gathered with the Wapanog tribe for three days of celebration. For the next two centuries, many individual colonies and states, primarily in the Northeast, carried on the tradition of fall Thanksgiving festivities. But each state celebrated it on a different day and sometimes on an occasional basis. It was not until 1863 that the holiday was celebrated on one day nationwide. In the aftermath of the Battle of Gettysburg, one of the bloodiest battles of our nation's civil war, President Abraham Lincoln proclaimed that the country would set aside one day to remember its many blessings. Quote, in the midst of a civil war of unequaled magnitude and severity, President Lincoln proclaimed, we recall the bounties which are so constantly enjoyed that we are prone to forget the source from which they come. As President Lincoln recognized, no human counsel hath devised nor hath any mortal hand worked out these great things. They are the gracious gifts of the Most High God, who, while dealing with an anger for our sins, hath nevertheless remembered mercy. Today we continue to celebrate Thanksgiving with a grateful and charitable spirit. When we open our hearts and extend our hands to those in need, we show humility for the bountiful gifts that we have received. In the aftermath of a succession of tragedies that have stunned and shocked our nation, Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria, the wildfires that ravaged the West, and the horrific acts of violence and terror in Las Vegas, New York City, and Sutherland Springs, we have witnessed the generous nature of the American people in the midst of heartache and turmoil. We are grateful for the swift action of the first responders, law enforcement personnel, military and medical professionals, volunteers, and everyday heroes who embodied our infinite capacity to extend compassion and humanity to our fellow man. 
as we mourn these painful events, we're ever confident that the perseverance and optimism of the American people will prevail. We can see in the courageous pilgrims who stood on Plymouth Rock, in a new land, in intrepidness that lies at the core of our American spirit. Just as the pilgrims did, today Americans stand strong, willing to fight for their families and their futures, to uphold our values and confront any challenge. This Thanksgiving, in addition to rejoicing in precious time spent with loved ones, let us find ways to serve and encourage each other in both word and deed. We also offer a special word of thanks for the brave men and women of our armed forces, many of whom must celebrate this holiday separated from the ones for whom they are most thankful. And as one people, we seek God's protection, guidance, and wisdom as we stand humbled by the abundance of our great nation and the blessings of freedom, family, and faith. Now, therefore, I, Donald J. Trump, President of the United States of America, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Constitution and the laws of the United States, do hereby proclaim Thursday, November 23, 2017, as a national day of thanksgiving. I encourage all Americans to gather in homes and places of worship to offer a prayer of thanks to God for our many blessings. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand this 17th day of November in the year of our Lord, 2017, and of the independence of the United States of America, the 242nd. Let's take our hymnals now and join together and sing hymn number 797, Come Ye Thankful People, Come. We'll stand to sing number 297.
you may be seated. Our scripture reading for today is 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I'll be reading verses 1 through 11 if you'd like to follow along. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. God's word for his people. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all Achaia, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Ye also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. Amen. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. May he bless our hearts with a deeper understanding of it. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We come to you this day offering our corporate thanksgiving. Each of us have individual things for which we give thanks, but together we give thanks for the great grace which you have shown to us, for the marvelous mercy extended to us in spite of our wickedness and our sins and our transgressions. We thank you for the privilege of being able to worship here today. We thank you for those who have gone before us. And Father, today I want to especially thank you for John Filker, who was here yesterday at this church because he wanted to clean, to do the humble service of cleaning this auditorium for the service today. And it was from here that he stepped into glory. We thank you, Father, for him, for his faithful, humble service to this church, for the impact that he made on the lives of every one of us present today, for his kindness, his humility, his generosity, his friendship, his consistency, his eagerness to serve. We thank you, Father, that he was a man of faith, 
though saved as an adult, how his life was transformed by Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for his family today, for those loved ones whom he has left behind, his mother, his children, his other relatives. Father, we pray for your special mercies upon them and upon all of his friends, so suddenly taken with shock that he would step so quickly from this life into heaven. We thank you for them, Father, for their love for John and for the things that they did that made an impact on his life. And we each personally thank you for him and for the impact that he made on our lives. We thank you, Father, for this church not merely the buildings and property, but for the people. We thank you, Father, for those who have stood for the truth through many generations here in this pulpit without compromise, without fear. We thank you, Father, for the impact it has made on this community and around the world. We thank you, Father, for this great nation in which you have placed us. And you've placed us here in a time when the lights appear to be going out all across our land. We used to have leaders who called for your blessing upon ministers of the gospel, who called for a moving of the Holy Spirit of God across this land and from this land to send missionaries to other parts of the world. A time when our leaders called us to national repentance and fasting, not merely feasting. When they called us to prayer instead of play. Help us never to forget our heritage. Father, we thank you that you are God. We praise you for who you are. We thank you for what you have done. And we humble ourselves in your presence this day. Cause us to remember that you have given us a command to pray for those in authority over us, that we might lead quiet and peaceable lives in godliness and in honesty. We thank you for the bounty of this land. We thank you for those whom you have called into service to protect us in the various Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, police forces, security. Father, we thank you for them because you have established the government and you have established the sword of power as you declare in Romans 13. We pray, Father, for their safety. We pray, Father, for their salvation. And we give you thanks that you have given us a nation whereby these are forces for good and not for oppression. Father, we pray for our president and vice president and their families. We pray for our Congress, the Senate and House of Representatives, where there is so much posturing and hypocrisy that you will bring them to true repentance and genuine faith in Christ. We pray for our Supreme Court and our lower courts. We pray for our current governor and the new governor about to take office and for their families. We pray, Father, for our State House in Trenton we pray for our county and municipal governments. O oh, Father, that the Holy Spirit of God would move across every one of these men and women and bring them to their senses, cause them to see their sins, cause them to understand that judgment is coming and Almighty God is holy. Cause them to fall on their knees before you and beg forgiveness 
through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and give them a new life in Christ, a transformed life whereby they will rule righteously and judge righteously and pass laws that are righteous laws in conformity with the word of God. Keep us from ever being ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We thank you, Father, for giving us salvation. Almighty God, we humbly come into your presence this day we are not worthy, but we come with our very weak and yet heartfelt thanksgiving and praise because we come in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. This morning as we take our thanksgiving offering, You'll see there's a note in your bulletins that there will be some specially marked WMS envelopes if you would like to give to the Women's Missionary Society. Or there are other envelopes where you can uh, give to designated funds which have already been approved by the session and the rest of the offerings will go to the church. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you now for this time of giving. You have given to us, you have given to us your very best. You have given to us your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, how we thank you for him. How we thank you for the gift, the special gift you gave to us at Christmas so long ago, and we're approaching that season once again when we remember the Incarnation. You gave us your best. And you gave it to us, you gave him to us, because you loved us. Father, we pray that as we give today, we, our giving might be because we love you and are responding to the one who first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. remain standing. We'll continue our worship by turning to the back of our programs, our bulletins. You'll find the hymn, Thanks to God. We'll sing all three verses. Thanks to God.
be seated. What a wonderful, wonderful day Thanksgiving is. The grateful spirit of Thanksgiving in the United States as brought to our continent by our European ancestors dates back over four centuries. It dates not merely to the pilgrims, although it is their celebration that we remember, but other Thanksgivings are also notable. In 1564, the French Huguenot Protestant colonists celebrated a day of thanksgiving at St. Augustine, Florida. Since, as you know, I am from Texas, I must at least mention a few special early thanksgiving days that were held there. In 1541, the Spanish explorer Coronado celebrated a day of thanksgiving with 1,500 of his soldiers at the Palo Duro Canyon in Texas. In 1598, another Spanish explorer, Juan de Oñate, and his expedition held a Thanksgiving Day celebration at El Paso, Texas. Uh, I suspect that you didn't learn about those Texas Thanksgiving Days in New Jersey textbooks when you were in grade school. Others that may be more familiar to you include, of course, the Thanksgiving Day celebration that was held by the Jamestown settlers when they landed in 1607 at Cape Henry in Virginia. Not long after that, the 1619, the settlers at the Berkeley Plantation, Virginia, held another joyful Thanksgiving celebration. But the most famous Thanksgiving day and the day to, back, to which we look back to in our current celebration dates to the pilgrims, that hearty band of brave souls who courageously left family, friends, homes, wealth, and then came to this frightening, unknown new world to search for religious freedom and the right to worship God according to the Bible. We'll speak of them in just a few moments, but first, we've just read our key text for today related to thanksgiving and suffering. The principal verses that we saw are three, verses eight, nine, and 10. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver us, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us, ye also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. Now, I think you all know the different kinds of sufferings that the apostle Paul had because in chapter 11, he lists his troubles. He talks about them right here in this very same passage of scripture. Brother the ministers of Christ, I speak as a fool. I'm more in labors, more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prison more frequent, in deaths off. Though the Jews five times received thy forty stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils and waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings, in hunger and thirst in fastings often in cold and nakedness, besides those things which are without, that which comes upon me daily, the care of all the churches, who's weak and I am not weak, who's offended and I burn not. If I must needs glory, I will glory in the things which concern my infirmities. We've never faced that kind of trouble that the Apostle Paul went through, and yet, in spite of all these things, he was able to write, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Just a few days ago on Thanksgiving Sunday, we talked about Thanksgiving and the will of God. 
Paul emphasizes the all things in Ephesians as well. Giving thanks always for all things, Ephesians 5.20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are no exceptions to the three things that Paul talks about where we can be unthankful. Number one, the events of life. There are no events of life where we can be unthankful. Imagine that. There are no events of life where we can be unthankful. There are two more. Did you get what Paul said there in 1 Thessalonians 5.18? There is never two, a time or trouble where we can be unthankful. And number three, there is never a circumstance of life that is outside the will of God. In all those different facets of human existence, the Word of God commands us that we're to be thankful. How is that possible? It's because we keep a focus on eternity and not a focus on time. Time is going downhill and someday will be no more. But eternity is always going uphill, always getting better, always getting richer, always getting fuller, always getting more beautiful. And it goes on forever, and it never gets smaller. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You see, God has promised to give us grace to face every trouble that comes our way with thanksgiving. Why is it possible? Because, you see, God guarantees a victory. Not just survival. God doesn't say, well, you'll survive it. God promises to give us victory in every trial of life, including the day that we face the ultimate enemy of death. Yesterday, John had a victory. He entered the courts of Christ in triumph. He has victory because of the resurrection of Christ. God promised victory and guaranteed it because Jesus rose from the dead. We thank God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the theme of 1 Corinthians 15. Victory, not merely survival. Paul emphasizes that great truth again in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, one chapter beyond where we have our reading. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. Always causeth us to triumph in Christ. And maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Why do other people know about Jesus? Because God gives us victory. And God makes the savor of the knowledge of Christ manifest to other people. Did you hear those two little short two-letter words? By us. Ah, friends, that's the magnificent calling to which you have been called, to which I have been called, for which we can give thanks. And no matter what is happening in the world around us, we can give thanks because God is manifesting Jesus Christ by us to those around us. Light in the darkness. Are you giving thanks in everything? Because you're focused on eternity, which is only getting bigger and more beautiful as the things of earth begin to grow dim and begin to pass away until they are no more. But eternity continues to expand and get more beautiful more glorious, more exciting, more intimate with Christ. Are you on that path? Then you can give thanksgiving. That's what today is about. Today we give thanksgiving to God for what he has done. We give him praise for who he is. We see him sovereignly working in this tiny little grain of dust out in the middle of an immense solar system which is in an even greater, larger universe with many solar systems, and on this tiny little piece of dust, God himself became man to redeem us from our sins. 
Is that not good news for which you are willing to die? Is that not good news so that you cannot resist telling others about Jesus? And giving thanks to God who has redeemed you for all of eternity. What a magnificent picture we are given in the scriptures. Remember those words were written by a man who suffered what we might even call heroic levels of suffering. You might expect words like that from Hercules or Samson or the Titans or the hardened warriors of Sparta, the elite imperial guard of Rome or the legendary women warriors of North mythology, the Valkyries. But those words were written by a tiny little Jew who was an academic, a bookworm, a scholar, not a warrior. Those words were written by a puny little Benjamite who was practically blind. That confident, energetic declaration was written by a feeble munchkin who could barely get a square meal and who almost lived like a homeless derelict wandering into the most awkward and dangerous situations. Thanksgiving in times of trouble. Does that strike you as somewhat incongruous? It really shouldn't. Dear friends, as you've heard me preach many times from this pulpit, we are moving into times of trouble. We see our society collapsing around us. We see the legal system being twisted beyond recognition. We see a denial that there were Christian founders of this country. We see all kinds of horrendous things that God condemns in his word with the death penalty being exalted and promoted as the good of the people. Yes, we are moving into times of trouble. Are you ready, even in that, to give thanks? That's what the God, God's word calls us to do. You know, of course, that the first American Thanksgiving was preceded by a time of intense suffering and death. And yet the pilgrims were able to give thanks and see the incredible providence and divine intervention of God. Ah, how many of them died that first year as death stalked the land and reaped with his grim sickle. And yet God had prepared a man to pave the way for them, those who stuck it out. The warmth of spring as the earth began to melt, they were surprised to see an Indian named Somerset walk into their pitiful little settlement and greet them in English. Somerset was a very intelligent man who had learned the English language from fishermen and trappers and traders. And after seeing their plight, Somerset let the roof mid makeshift shelters the pilgrims had built, and they thought, well, they'd probably never see him again. But just one week later, he returned with one of his close friends named Squanto, who was also able to communicate with the pilgrims in their own tongue. God had also been preparing the heart of Squanto to respond to the gospel. And of course, the pilgrims were ready to share the good news of salvation. These were Christian founders of our country, not pagans who wanted to share with him the latest video game. These two men, Somerset and Squanto, provided the bridge that formed a friendship and long-lasting peace treaty between the pilgrims and the Wapanog Indians. Not long after that, Squanto trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. This was the man that God used to show the pilgrims how to live in the new world. Governor William Bradford described Squanto as, quote, a special instrument sent of God for our good and never left us till he died, unquote. There are no accidents in life, dear people. There is a sovereign God who loves you. He is superintending your life. Nothing can get in that is not according to his will. And always within that context, he's bringing people and events into your life to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. He's a God to whom we can give thanks. We see that here with the pilgrims. That summer, the summer of 1621, following the dreadful winter of 1620, the pilgrims, still persevering in prayer and assisted by their new Indian friends, reaped a bountiful harvest. The pilgrims deeply appreciated the help that the Indians had given to them, but that did not blind them to the fact that in reality, the fruitful harvest had been a gracious and undeserved gift from the hand of Almighty God. 
As Pilgrim Edward Winslow, later to become governor, wrote, quote, God be praised. We had a good increase of Indian corn, end quote. By the goodness of God, we are far from want. Oh, you all know about that first great Thanksgiving dinner that they had, a three-day time in 1621 December, including lobster, oysters, clams, turkey, cornbread, berries, deer, and other wonderful New World foods. The young men let off steam in multiple athletic contests. The women cooked and enjoyed the fellowship. But unfortunately, that is the only thing that some people remember with our Thanksgiving feast, fellowship, and watching TV. <laughs> For those of you who are carnal enough to own a TV. I'm joking. But other times of stress and hardship loomed on the horizon. Just two years later, in 1623, the pilgrims experienced a severe extended and prolonged drought. They knew that unless God sent rain, there would be no harvest. And they would again be faced with a devastating winter filled with death and with starvation. Two years after the first Thanksgiving there, this time rather than hold a feast, the pilgrims soberly gathered for a time of corporate prayer and fasting. When was the last time you fasted and prayed? During that prayer and fasting, they besought God to intervene and send rain. Even as earlier they had gratefully acknowledged that he was the one who sent their initial bounty, they also understood, they knew thoroughly, that he could chasten them for their sins and withhold his blessing. Dear friends, the pilgrims were the true children of the Reformation. They had the same lineage that we have. They went back to the reformers who stood on the word of God and trusted the God of heaven rather than the Pope of Rome. They were true believers in the sovereign God of the Bible. That's the Reformation theology, is that God is sovereign. They understood the declaration of the Apostle Paul in Acts 14 that only God could give rain and a fruitful harvest. And that when he did so, it would be a witness to unbelievers. They put it together. They understood this, Acts 14, 17. That's what the New Testament specifically says. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness. How did God leave a witness? in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. They grabbed that verse. They said, we've had no rain. We're facing another winter of starvation. It's the God of heaven who gives the rain and the fruitful harvest, and he does it as a witness. And so the pilgrims decided to pray and fast. The Indians were curious to see what would happen because the pilgrims were quite open about what they planned to do. The pilgrims fully expected God to hear their prayers. They fully expected God to answer with rain. At that point, many of the Indians became skeptical about the God of the pilgrims. Could he really do such a thing as bring rain without all the traditional sacrifices, all of the traditional rituals, all the shamanistic ceremonies? Could God do it just because they fasted and prayed? And yet at the call of Governor Bradford, the pilgrims gathered openly for a time of prayer and fasting to seek God's direct intervention. They never doubted that God would hear and answer their prayers. Almost immediately after the prayer and fasting, and to the utter amazement of the Indians who witnessed the scene, clouds appeared in the sky. Do you remember the days of Elijah when he's upon Mount Carmel and he's praying for rain? <coughs> and he says to his servant, go and look at the sky. The servant comes back and says, I don't see anything. Go again. Come back. Time after time until finally the servant says, I see a cloud about the size of a man's hand. Elijah says, then start running. We've got to get to Jezreel. There's a storm coming. 
And he outran Ahab's chariot to Jezreel. That was what was happening with the pilgrims. Clouds appeared in the sky. A gentle, steady rain began to fall. Listen to the words that Governor Bradford wrote upon this occasion. Quote, It came without either wind or thunder or any violence. And by degrees, in abundance, as that ye earth was thoroughly wet and soaked therewith, which did so apparently revive and quicken ye decayed corn and other fruits, as was wonderful to see, and made ye Indians astonished to behold. And afterwards the Lord sent them such seasonable showers with interchange of fair warm weather as, through his blessing, caused a fruitful and liberal harvest to their no small comfort and rejoicing. Unquote. Indeed, God had not left himself without a witness, just as the Apostle Paul explained in Acts 14. And seeing his direct intervention and action in response to the prayers and fastings of his people, many of the Indians were drawn to the true God and away from their pagan deities. The threatening drought that would have brought more suffering was averted, not only for the benefit of the pilgrims, but for the saving benefit of the Indians. In everything the pilgrims could give thanks, for this experience proved to the Indians that the god of the pilgrims was greater than the traditional pagan gods that their ancestors had worshipped. Oh, there were many, many thanksgivings after that. When we look back at the days of the American revolutions, Congress issued seven separate proclamations for fasting and prayer, plus a day of thanksgiving, making a total of 15 prayer proclamations issued by Congress during the War of Independence. We talked about the first national thanksgiving in 1789. We saw 1815, various state governments in the United States had issued at least 1,400 official prayer proclamations. By 1815, we're 202 years out from then. From 1789 to 1815, 1,400 official prayer proclamations. Half of the time for Thanksgiving and prayer and the other time for fast, fasting and prayer. Historically, our great nation has understood the connection between suffering and responding with a thankful heart. When suffering comes, give thanks to God because you've kept your eyes focused on eternity and not merely on stuff. Thanksgiving to God for all of his good benefits which we tend to overlook when the temporal affairs of earth seem to be out of order. Over the last several months, we've experienced only the tiniest taste of this kind of destructive bloodshed on our own soil, with multiple mass shootings from Las Vegas and elsewhere to random truck attacks in New York City, not to mention the previous Muslim attacks on the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, the dune flight that was directed, diverted by brave passengers over Shanksville, and recently the insane shooting down in Texas. Dear people, if we want to respond properly to God, we confess our sins, knowing that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Those early proclamations in our land all contained confession of sin as a nation, as a state, as a community. They contain calls for the proclamation of the gospel, and they all contained thanksgiving and praise for the God of heaven who judges righteously. How we pray that that might be the case in our nation, not only that God would extend his judgment on the wicked, but that he would extend his mercy to us as we humbly confess our sins unto him. We must never forget that God uses times of suffering to refocus our attention 
on the things of heaven. He uses times of suffering to cause us to yearn for things that cannot be seen. He uses times of suffering to help us understand what things are really important. And for that we can be thankful and filled with joy because the best is yet to come. Paul didn't just tell us to give thanks when we're facing trouble. He set the example for us. Our Lord Jesus Christ is also an example of the quiet suffering with a thankful heart. Peter writes and he says, For this is thankworthy, that is worthy of thanksgiving, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when you are buffeted for your faults you shall take it patiently, but if when you do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because, listen carefully, Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. We've talked about how this relates to victory because we're focused on eternity so that we have the victory in Jesus Christ so that when we step out of this life and step into glory, the things of earth are gone. Oh, how thankful will our hearts be then. But now is the time to express it to God as we go through this world expressing thanksgiving, expressing praise because God has promised us eternity. Uh, I hope when you go from this place today that your heart will be filled with that kind of thanksgiving, that kind of praise, that kind of joy that comes from knowing that you not only have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but from knowing that you have eternity ahead which is guaranteed by him. We need to pray for our nation that God will prepare our people so that they will be ready for national repentance. But it must start at home. Are you prepared for repentance? Are you praying that God will prepare this great land of America for repentance and revival? It appears that God has at least given us a temporary reprieve in our current administration. But we must also remember that sometimes God uses times of trouble to bring his people to a spirit of true thanksgiving by giving them godly leadership and true repentance as a nation. Pray for our leaders that we might lead quiet and peaceable lives in godliness and honesty as they turn to the God of heaven. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the time we've had here today. We give you grateful thanks for you are the true, the living God. We give you thanksgiving that you have yet withheld your hand of wrath and judgment upon our nation in our time. And again, we pray that you will turn the hearts of all of our leaders in every branch of government, at every level of government, that you would turn their hearts to the living God, who alone can bring peace, who alone can give life, who alone can give joy and meaning and purpose. And Father, we pray that you will begin it with us. We come to you in humble repentance. We thank you, as Washington put it, for your signal mercies to us. And we pray, Father, that we might be the people that you have designed us to be, whose hearts are always, always filled with thanksgiving. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your